Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shireen Ash. I'm a librarian at the Marin County Free Library based at the Corte Madera branch, and I'm thrilled today to welcome Bob Moselle from the Marin Master Gardeners um, because he is going to be giving us this phenomenal presentation about um, bringing habitat into our yards and gardens, so how we can attract birds and bees and butterflies to our garden. So, um, I understand one person's having trouble hearing, but if everyone else is hearing, I'm just gonna proceed and try to help that person independently after the intro. So welcome again. Um, let me take a moment to just explain our structure. So um, please stay muted throughout the presentation. There will be time for questions and answers. Um, at the end, you can put your questions in the chat and I will share them with Bob. Um, thank you very much for the person who mentioned that they can hear me just fine. That is comforting to know that it's not a universal problem. So again, questions in the chat, there'll be time. Um, there'll be time for um, your thoughts at the end. So keep track of that. Um, and also we are recording. So the, um, um, recording of this great presentation can be found on the Marin County Free Library YouTube channel, along with many other Master Gardener programs. If you haven't discovered them, I really suggest you look. There's some wonderful recordings there. And in addition, um, you might find some other programs of interest too. So take a look. See, again, that's just go to YouTube and type in Marin County Free Library and it'll bring up everything. Um, so let me introduce our speaker today. Um, Bob is the co-founder and co-chair of the Native Plants Guild. He is the co-chair of the Garden Walks Project of the Marin Master Gardeners, and he is an original member of the Marin Master Gardeners Fire Smart Project team. So you can see in the 17 years that he's been a master gardener, he has been very busy gardening and organizing and sharing his expertise. In addition to all that, he is a member of the California Native Plant Society and very active birder, so no surprise, he's part of the Marin Audubon Society too. So today he is here to share his expertise with all of us. I'm very thrilled that he is here. So Bob, do you wanna show your face and then you can start the program and I will disappear until the end where I'll take your questions. Well, thanks very much, Shereen. Uh, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the birds uh, and the bees uh, and the butterflies and uh, a little bit about us, too, us people, uh, because uh, how they fare will determine how we fare as well. Um, so uh, let's see if I can get everything to work here. There we go. Okay, if you like birds uh, and you love butterflies, uh, if you're worried about bees, uh, and if you're worried about people too, and uh, that is the entire UC Marin Master Gardener uh, Native Plants Guild holding up uh, the name of their favorite native plant. Uh, and that's me up there, I'm the only one holding up an entire species because I'm a Ceanothus nut. So uh, uh, habitat corridors will help all of those, um, including us people. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about why habitat gardening, uh, the building of a garden uh, or a habitat for plants and other wildlife. Um, and this seminar is really, uh, you know, only going to start uh, as basically Habitat Gardening 101. Uh, if you decide to Habitat Garden at all, or even a piece of your garden as a habitat, um, there's plenty of information available. Um, and men, much of it is on the Master Gardener um, website but a lot of it is in uh, books like these, which is the references that I've used, and many of them are in your local library. Um, and uh, I, I a list of them is on the various slides about the specific information. 
So we're going to talk about making a habitat garden, the kind of plants to use, how to make one. And then we're going to talk about the clients for a habitat garden. And not surprisingly, uh, that's the, will, the wildlife. So I mean, I'd like to start by answering this question. Uh, what is a habitat? Um, and uh, I've kind of stolen from a uh, young man in the fourth grade of the Spencerport New York Elementary School. Uh, when I asked his class that question, he raised his hands and we were talking about birds then. And he gave the best answer that I've ever heard of what a habitat is. And what he said was, a habitat is where birds find what they need. Uh, and that's what a habitat is. Um, a habitat is where native wildlife, including plants and people, find what they need for life. Food, water, and an infrastructure in which to live. Um, so why build one? Uh, you know, some of you may even have one if you live in some of the wilder areas of uh, Marin County. Um, but the reason why I'm trying to convince people uh, to build a habitat is to restore what has been lost. And more important, or as important, build a more sustainable future environment. And, and the reason why we think that's a problem is because we think there's an increasingly bad situation in terms of building a habitat. Um, and then finally, the problem is, uh, this is my neighbor. Uh, this guy, and it is a male, um, is a California towhee. And he's got in his beak uh, a caterpillar. Um, and uh, he's my neighbor. He lives in our garden, or we live in his garden. Um, and he is, um, and his mate are taking care of typically about five to six um, uh, 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 nestlings. And in order to take those nestlings from the time they hatch, um, uh, or from the time they hatch until they fledge, which means they fly, um, this guy and his mate need to find 350 of these every day. And if you think he's looking a little bit tired, he probably is because it's becoming harder and harder and harder for him and her to find those 350 a day. And the answer to that question is why? Well, the reason why is because the insects that lay the eggs that hatch into these caterpillars are declining in population. And so go as the caterpillar and insects that lay their eggs decline, so go the birds and other wildlife. So that's the situation that we're trying to address. And my plea is to help this dad. Uh, he's my neighbor, you've got him too. Um, and the sooner we build sustainable habitats, the better off he and we will be. You know, California has got a unique biodiversity. Um, and uh, basically, it is the most unique um, biodiversity in the United States, or actually in North America. Um, and it's about number five in the world in terms of uniqueness of biodiversity. And, and uh, we have in this state 10 bioregions uh, from deserts to mountains uh, and to seashore. Uh, and bioregions are defined by a distinct uh, selection of topography, climate, and associated um, uh, communities. 
Um, and, and we really have uh, one of the most diverse. Let me just give you a few examples. California's got 30,000 species of insects, about 8,000 species of plants, and folks in the California Native Plant Society and others keep finding new ones, so this keeps growing. About 563 species of birds, of which, if you plan your uh, habitat right, about 120 species might serve up in your backyard. 190 mammals, 96 reptiles, 63 freshwater fish, and 46 amphibians and other herps. So it's really diverse. Um, uh, and, the pro and the problem is it's threatened. If we think about California, before all of us got here, um, we have a contiguous habitat. And the problem is that we're, we're very fortunate. We have uh, wild environments all around us, but a diverse ecosystem is increasingly um, affected by the fact that land conversion by agricultural, commercial, and residential development has decreased the amount of our uh, habitat, even here in Marin County. Um, and uh, the problem is it's not only decreased the amount of it, but it's whatever is left has been fragmented significantly. And the problem with that is that in each of these smaller remnants of the original habitat, the populations in there are small and they are easily challenged by perturbations uh, in the climate, um, in the weather, um, in, by fires, and so on. So the problem is that if, if that happens, each of these smaller patches, as their populations shrink, as the physical habit change, habitat changes, and because they are separated from each other, there's no intermingling. And so they can't be replaced because if there are um, uh, remnants in other of the remnants of the original habitat, they can't get there because there's no safe highway for them to do that. And the problem with that is that it increasingly, def def it, it increasingly shrinks the natural eco ecosystem services that natural habitats provide to us. And those are important. Um, so, so what happens is, and I'm sure you've heard this time and time again, that, that we're losing earth support. We're reducing our planet's ability to sustain us. To sustain us. And the, the way we're doing that is by losing the natural ecosystem services that we need and that earth provides. Uh, things like, you know, small things like clean air and water and weather moderation, flood control, carbon sequestration, natural pest control, pollination services, fertile topsoil, forest products, stable fisheries, and so on. And the beat continues. Um, it's not getting better and we need to do something about it. And everybody says, well, we need to do something about it. But I'm here today to try to get each of us to do something about it. The, the, the problem is that the, not only is the current situation unsustainable, but it's very little that you know, our government and uh, so can do something about it. The, you know, existing parks, there are too few of them. Existing preserves, they're too small and they are becoming increasingly fragmented. 
And the, you know, the, the powers that be who would want to expand them can't expand them far, fast enough. There's limited available land for them to use. And worse than that, as we know, um, I'm going to call it institutional entrop entropy is sluggish. Well, what that means is we can't get anything done. Um, and so how do you deal with this kind of a situation? Uh, well, uh, Doug Ptolemy, in his book, Nature's Best Hope, um, uh, put forward a solution which I think we should all adopt. And that is to do it ourselves, to, to build diversity uh, by using not public land, but the land around our homes. Um, in the United States, there's about 40 million acres of lawn. Uh, 40 million acres would uh, make a pretty robust national park. Um, and and it, uh, on the, of the plantings around our homes, about 60% of them are exotics. Uh, and the problem with that is they're pretty, but wildlife doesn't necessarily recognize them as food to be used or to provide shelter. Um, so what we can do is to use the land around our homes and native plants to build habitats that will help begin to solve this problem. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about native plants is because it actually all begins to the with the plants. Plants are what take the energy from the sun and convert it into things that we and all of the other life forms on this planet can use. And so therefore, natives can increase species diversity faster than anything else. And the reason for that is pretty simple, that everything else recognizes plants as something that they can use to help them continue to grow and live. So what we're talking about here is to take these fragments and instead of having all of this safe, all of this space about them, to build corridors between them using the gardens in our homes, using the landscape around commercial buildings, using the hedgerows uh, of farms uh, and uh, other agricultural sites to help reconnect these wildland remnants, to provide a safe corridor for life forms to move between them and to remain vibrant and um, available to all of nature. Um, now, uh, you, you gotta ask yourself, well, how are you gonna do that? Um, and, and the way to help that, to reconnect it, is for each of us to build some part of the land around our home, however small it might be, that would provide a safe harbor for wildlife as it tries to move between these and rebuild the unity of them. So, how do we build a habitat garden? Well, I'm gonna talk about some first principles. And the first first principle is create an earth-friendly habitat. And the second principle is keep your cats indoors. Uh, and the reason for that is because cats are an exotic uh, in our, con our country. Um, and wildlife doesn't necessarily recognize it as a threat or doesn't have the ability to deal with that threat. Um, and so one great thing that we can do is to keep cats indoors. It's better for the cats. The American Veterinary Association says that the um, lifespan 
of an outdoor cat, even only on the temp part is about half that of a cat that is protected by being indoors. Um, and so it's good for the cats, it's good for everything else. Other first principles is you wanna attract, support, protect and observe native plants, birds, bees and other pollinators, butterflies, beneficial insects, herps. And if you're, you don't know what an herp is, think about snakes, lizards, um, and the kind of related uh, species to them. Uh, small mammals and people. And again, I'm gonna say that it really all begins with the plants and so will we. Um, you want to, when you think about now, okay, what am I gonna plant? The first thing you wanna think about is, is what I'm going to plant compatible with the remaining natural habitat that I'm trying to help link? Is it sustainable and easy on the land? And finally, is it doable? Uh, and by that, I really mean it doesn't have to be big. Now, I'm, I'm fortunate or unfortunate, uh, depends on what I'm doing at the time. I, you know, I've got a fairly large lot, about, uh, oh, I'd say uh, three quarters of an acre. So, but it doesn't have to be three quarters of an acre. And in fact, the habitat garden that I've got is much less than three quarters of an acre. And it can be the same in your backyard. So the reason why I keep talking about plants, native plants, and now plant communities that are around you is because the natural habitats in Marin for plants have co-evolved with the climate, with the topography, with the soil, with the animals and the birds and the insects and other life forms that surround them. Um, and the native plants do well when they're planted in their, I'll call it, home. And we've got five major plant communities or homes for plants here in Marin County. Um, I live in the Oak Foothill Woodlands. It's relatively dry. It gets kind of hot uh, in the summertime. Uh, it's got persistent wind, uh, rolling hills, steep slopes, and so on. Um, and so I try to think about um, what, uh, what, other, what plants normally grow here, and that's what I try to grow in my garden. Grasslands, similarly, it's even order, often hotter and drier than Goak Woodlands. It, it too is rolling hills and steep slopes. Um, and it is the most challenged plant community uh, in Marin County and actually in the entire state. And the reason why it, ha it has been largely converted to agricultural land and therefore the grasses that you see here and the plants that you see here are largely exotics. They you eat their annual grasses and weeds, if you will, instead of perennials as in the native grassland. And that's because it's been converted largely uh, into agricultural land. In, in the warmer areas and drier areas, um, the wild growth, uh, particularly on slopes, is chaparral. Um, and uh, it has been, um, you know, it, it, is, it is, consists of shrubby, twiggy, mainly shrubby, twiggy um, plants like um, manzanita and ceanothus and so on. Um, uh, and it, it, is, it is real wild land. And one of the reasons why it is real wild land, it's very hard and difficult for um, people to penetrate. And then down in South County um, and over in um, West Marin, we've got redwood or mixed evergreen fog belt uh, uh, forests. And uh, the difference, by the way, um, uh, between a woodland and a forest 
is that a woodland has an open canopy with a lot of separation between the trees. A forest has a relatively closed canopy with, as you can see in this picture, very little um, uh, distance between the uh, branches uh, of the trees here. And then in that environment, what is the analogy of a chaparral is northern coastal scrub, which is less twiggy, cooler, and requiring more um, water in both the winter and the summer uh, than uh, the chaparral does. So those are the environments we're talking about. And so what, what we should think about is trying to mirror that natural landscape uh, to, to, to give you know, the kind of environment safe and healthy that wildlife can have as it moves through. Uh, so if you live uh, in an area that is open woodland, um, you want to get plants that will grow in open woodland. And a good source to find information on what is uh, the kind of plant community I live in is a, um, uh, a, a um, website that has been created by the California Native Plant Society called CalScape, C-A-L-S-C-A-P-E. If you sign on to CalScape and type in um, your zip code, uh, it will bring up a list of plants that normally grows in your area. And more important than just the list of plants, it will give you a lot of information on how to take care of it, how to plant it, and even where to find it if you wanna go out and buy some. So it's a really good resource. So that's Calscape, C-A-L-S-C-A-P-E dot org. Um, and uh, at the end of this presentation, you'll see a list of plants that I put together for growing in uh, a, a native plant garden uh, that may help you uh, think about it. Uh, sustainability, native soils. Um, if you're going to plant a native plant, plant it in a native soil. Native plants, you can use those to limit or replace lawns and non-natives. Uh, but what we would like you to think about, particularly in the climate change that we now are experiencing, is to think about drought tolerant plants and pollinator friendly plants. Uh, those are what you need to build a healthy habitat. Um, and the, the final thing is to limit pesticides. Use integrated pest management or IPM uh, to determine how to deal with the things that are going wrong or problems in your garden. So, so you know, well, what does, what's the needs of a wildlife habitat? Well, remember our definition of a habitat. It's where wild, native wildlife finds what it needs. So the backbone is native plants. They've co-evolved, they're preferred, and most important, they are used heavily, more, much more heavily by our wildlife than uh, uh, the exotic plants that we may have planted. Uh, for example, um, birds use native plants about five times more frequently and spend about three times more time on them uh, than exotic plants. Insects uh, and are you know, the same. They use them more frequently and so on. And some insects, as we'll find later, like butterflies, have to have native plants. So here's an example. This is Ceanothus dark star. It grows in my garden. Uh, in fact, that is one of my plants. Um, and here are the kinds of services it provides for birds. It provides cover, it provides forage for insects, 
And for a lot of birds, it provides seeds for food. For bees, it's an early pollen and nectar source, as it is for butterflies. Most important, it's a host plant for butterflies. They lay their eggs on it because their caterpillars can eat the leaves, um, but they can't eat the leaves of a non-native plant. Insects use it for curd, cover and for forage, namely other insects. And people, uh, these kinds of things provide essential national, natural services, one of which, as I've got in the bottom of here, is frankly crippling beauty of its blooms. When this thing is in bloom and the sun is on it, it just glows royal blue. It's just amazing. That's why I'm a Ceanothus nut. So, oaks. If, you know, we had one tree that we had to keep here, what we would keep is our native oaks. It's food, cover, and nesting for, at different times of the year, over about 5,000 different wildlife species. Uh, 300 wildlife species in terms of just birds and mammals. Uh, hundreds of insect species use this. Uh, they use it for nesting, they use it for food, and uh, in the case of five um, uh, local butterflies and moths, they use it as a host a plant. But these three trees are threatened um, by introduced um, sudden oak death and other insects that um, prey on the insects that use this uh, healthily. So a habitat garden is where you plant for food and cover. Native plants are preferred. Non-natives, if you have to, to fill in. No invasives. And plant for all seasons, or as many seasons as you can. Think about food plants, berries, seeds, nuts, cone bearing, and so on. And they also provide cover. Think about cover plants, places to roost, nest, protection, even an emergency hideaway, uh, deciduous trees, conifers, brambles, ground covers. They can also provide food. And butterflies and moths are special. They need host plants. They must be native because, they, as I said before, their caterpillars can't eat non-natives. And they may all be also be restrictive to even special one or two species of native plants. So it gets really bad with that. That happens to be a monarch uh, caterpillar, um, and it is eating on a species of uh, milkweed. Um, so habitat plantings, native or non-native. There's a wide variety of them uh, and important families of them that are native to uh, Marin County are the heaths, which are the Arbutus and Manzanita, uh, Buckthorn, which is Ceanothus, the coffee berry and others, Sunflowers, which is a broad variety that provides a broad spectrum of valuable plants to insects particularly, but also to butterflies and uh, birds. Mint, sage, catmint, lavender, and buckwheat are wild California buckwheat. So here's an example of some of these. Um, here's the manzanita, Arctostaphylos. Uh, these are twiggy plants for the most part, um, and they are important uh, because they bloom at a time of the year when nothing else is in bloom, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and Ceanothus, <laughs> well, I grow all of these. Every one of these plants I grow, plus another, I don't know, 18 uh, species. My wife says, I've never met a Ceanothus I didn't like, and she's absolutely right. But what she doesn't notice necessarily is that I feel that way about Manzanita too. So here are shrubs and small trees, and you'll notice that many of them 
are trees that have berries or seeds that the birds can use, that insects can use. Um, and so they provide food as well as shelter and in some cases, even um, uh, uh, a nesting material. A mint, um, uh, if you ever wanna see birds and bees go a little bit berserk about mint, uh, about mint and uh, others, take a look at surge plant, sage plants. Um, you can see here a mint plant, hyssop. Uh, I took this in our garden. That's a, a female um, hummingbird uh, using her unique bill to use these, the nectar at the bottom of these plants. These plants and those birds have co-evolved co together. And we have a lot of other perennials and subtrubs that provide flowers that can be used by wildlife that provide uh, nectar and so on um, that are valuable. Not all of these plants grow in all of the, the, the um, plant communities. And that's the reason why it's important for you to know what plant community you're in so that you can use plants that are preferred by the wildlife in that. Water, <laughs> that's a critical source. Um, and not all of us, particularly here in North Nevada, uh, have a beautiful creek like that running in our backyards. So if we don't have natural sources, we can really do a job by providing water for wildlife um, as long as it, we keep it clean. Um, here's bird baths. Um, they're the easiest way to bring in um, wildlife and provide water to them. And even though they're called bird baths, um, you will find small mammals using them. You will find insects using them. And in the mud underneath them, you'll even find butterflies using them. That's called mudding. Um, and that's how butterflies get their liquids. So uh, it also, I think, provides some fun for the birds. Uh, here are 10 um, uh, cedar wax wings uh, in one of our bird baths. And you can't tell me that they are there just for a drink or to get clean. They're having fun. Uh, and that went on for about a half hour. But be careful, you can get carried away. You might end up with something like this. Um, we did, uh, because we did get carried away. So a habitat car at a garden. Well, you're looking at one. Uh, this is a, a garden that is about 15 by 18 feet. Um, uh, it could be eight by 10 feet um, or even five by seven feet. Um, but what it has is a variety of plants that bloom on different times of the year. Uh, so there's plants in bloom throughout the entire year um, and that provide nectar, pollen, um, and other insects um, for wildlife to use. It also, as you can see, provides heavy cover um, and birds and small mammals and fence lizards use this um, not only for foraging ground, but also to dive into when something comes after them. What you're seeing here are plants that provide good pollen um, and that plants have a broad um, uh, uh, reach of uh, floral growth. Um, this is a native verbena, verbena lilacina. Um, uh, it, grows, it grows in a 
It's a low growing shrub. Um, uh, it, it, it brings in butterflies and birds, hummingbirds um, and uh, other, other animals. Um, and it is typically in bloom uh, from about, I'd say mid-April mid to almost Thanksgiving. Um, and there are other plants in this habitat garden that are here. This is a uh, hybrid um, salvia, and uh, it is in bloom almost 12 months of the year. So that's the kind of thing that you want to put into a habitat garden. Um, and as I say, it does not have to be large. Um, and on a, on a warm summer day, there are more bees, butterflies, birds, hummingbirds, and so on in this uh, particular garden than frankly anywhere else in our garden. Um, this is a windflower, a wallflower. Um, it is uh, in bloom for typically about six months out of the year. Um, these are salvia. Uh, sage, um, uh, and uh, uh, when they are in bloom, there are hundreds of both native and honeybees working uh, these plants. So this is the kind of thing that we're trying to basically sell. Um, and to make it easy on you, at the end of this presentation is a list of the plants that you could use in a small garden, like I've been showing you, or in a larger garden. Um, and I encourage you, when we get to that, we'll put it up. Um, if you've got your phone handy, you can take a screenshot of the two uh, pages of it, um, or you can uh, send your address in uh, to Shireen at the library, and she'll send you uh, uh, an email back with this attached to it. So the mechanics, well, they're pretty easy. First of all, this may sound counterintuitive, but use smaller plants, four inch plants, one gallon plants. Native plants establish faster in your garden if they're smaller rather than larger. Um, and plus the fact they're less expensive and they're easier to plant because you don't have to dig a, a big hole like you do if you put a five gallon plant in. Use California natives and other plants that grow in other Mediterranean regions in the world, like the Mediterranean basin or the Southeast um, uh, shores of Australia um, or South Africa um, uh, and other, the other places, the other, two other places where native, uh, where a Mediterranean plants live. Plant naturally. It, it, one of the nice things about a native plant garden is it doesn't have to look neat. As a matter of fact, it's better if it doesn't because then it looks more like nature. Um, think about hydrosomes, plants that require the same kind of water and plant those together. Think about fire ladders, don't have them. And we'll talk a little bit later about how to avoid them. Uh, and think about maturity in terms of spacing. Um, uh, there was once a book written that the title was, but it was so small when I planted it. And what we don't need is uh, very large trees in everybody's front yard because they thought it was so small when I planted it. When you plant natives, use native soil. Don't till, don't cultivate, don't fertilize. Dig a hole that's twice the size of the plant uh, ball. Um, keep the keep the uh, keep the crown of the plant down here at the bottom at least two inches above grade. If you've got gophers. Put some gopher wire in the hole and mulch around this plant, but keep the mulch away from 
the stem or trunk of it uh, because that could damage or even kill a young plant. So irrigation is key to the establishment. Group plants in terms of their water requirements. Irrigate even native plants for one to two years. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to irrigate infrequently and deeply. Um, and you want to make sure that you keep the crown clear and above grade. When we did our first planting here in our garden, um, the crew that we had hired to do it um, uh, did not understand that. And we had about a 50% loss uh, of the plants because what happened is the hole filled in the crown got covered, and then it was hit by crown rot disease. So does it work? Well, you bet it does. This is a male hummingbird using the flowers of the manzanita. Um, and you can see him going into the flowers. Uh, hummingbirds uh, are the one of the major, if not the major, uh, pollinator of um, manzanitas. Uh, manzanitas bloom in early winter when hummingbirds are nesting. And in fact, they're probably the only thing that's blooming in early winter when hummingbirds are nesting. And so hummingbirds provide pollination that manzanitas need. Manzanitas provide food for male and female hummingbirds um, when nothing else is in bloom. These plants and animals co-evolve together. You know how a hummingbird um, pollinates the plant? The plant has anthers at the top of the flower and the pollen transfers from the plant to the forehead of the hummingbird. And so that when the hummingbird flies from flower to flower, uh, it pollinates these plants with its forehead. So the clients for all of this, well, I'm gonna start with birds because I'm a birder. Um, uh, and uh, there's a happy lady hummingbird. Uh, our yard list here is about 78 species. That's not bad for a suburban uh, yard list. Um, and uh, what's more important that about 20 to 25 of those species last year or the year before last uh, nested here um, because they found a habitat where they were safe and felt that they could nest here safely. One thing that you think about when you think about birds, if you wanna bring them in, and you wanna bring them in closer, provide some supplemental food. And here's a list of the kinds of foods that you might provide um, and the kinds of birds that would use that food. Um, and so uh, things like um, uh, black oil sunflowers, which everybody uses, or things like um, a syrup made of one part sugar and four parts boiling water with no red dye that hummingbirds would use. Or would you believe it, grape jelly that Orioles will use. So this is this will be in the recorded version of this. Take a screenshot of this and see if it'll help you bring birds in. It did here. Nesters, California quail, barn owl. Uh, we have a barn owl house, and from the first year we put it in, we've got barn owls. Uh, a barn owl family eats 3,000 gophers a year. If you've got gophers, you want a barn owl. Our, new, our woodpeckers, Nuttles woodpecker, acorns, um, cute little birds that I love, oak titmouse, chestnut-backed chickadees, and bush tits, um, beautiful hooded orioles. That's him right up there, and he is on a great jelly feeder. Uh, and then hummingbirds, Annas, who are year round here, Rufus, who 
commute between Southern California and the Sierras and all the way up to Alaska. That little bird weighs less than a nickel. It flies from Southern California to Nome, Alaska. I know because we've seen them in both places. Um, and uh, it does that in about four or five days. Um, and then Black Chin, who is a um, migrant uh, that we see fairly rarely here in Marin County. And then we've got the sparrows, um, three of which, the spotted towhee, California towhee, and dark-eyed junco are uh, year-round residents. Um, and three of which, the white-crowned and golden-crowned sparrows, which have just arrived back here in Marin County, and the fox sparrow are winter migrants. They spend the winter here. The bees and other pollinators. So, you know, in Marin County, there are hundreds of species of bees. Uh, we've got, I, I'm no entomologist, so I don't know what they are. I, I, I can tell you that three of the species of bumblebees and two of the species of carpenter bees look different here. And one species, of sweat bees, well, sweat bees don't look like anything else. So I was able to identify those. But there are others that are pollinators and very, very important to us and predators to keep the bad birds, the bad bugs away. Um, when you think about building an environment for these, the first thing you want to do is limit pesticide use. If you've got problems in your gardens, go to IPM, the Integrated P Pesticide Management uh, lists and use the, the remedies put in there. And for ground nesting native bees, and many of our native bees are ground nesters, clear some mulch away uh, in your garden so that there's bare soil that, so they can dig down through that bare soil to build their nests. So here's the honeybee. Uh, that's not a native, um, but it is established here. This is a sweat bee. It is in a water lily flower. So you can see how teeny that is. But then we've got our big Western bumblebees, and California carpenter bees, um, uh, our sweat bees, our mason bees, our leaf cutter bees. And we've got surfing flies or hover flies. You've seen these little guys, they're teeny little guys, some of them, and they look like a hovering um, helicopter. Um, the, the adults eat pollen and nectar, but their larvae, when they lay their eggs on your roses, eat up to 30 aphids a day each. So you wanna love these guys because they hate your aphids. The butterflies, and that's a, a California ringlet um, on there. Um, we have 25 species here um, and about four species of moths. We have more than four species of moths, but I've only been able to identify four of them. Uh, again, you want to provide pollen and nectar rich, rich plants and host plants for these guys or ladies. Um, and you want to provide mudding areas. Again, clear some of that mulch away, let it get wet, uh, and it'll be visited by your butterflies um, and your um, moths. And again, limit pesticide use. So here are some really nifty looking uh, butterflies that we've seen in our uh, backyard. Uh, skippers. Uh, which are small butterflies, uh, but lots of them, and they really are nifty looking. Most of them look like this in their cross section. They look like a right sided uh, triangle on its side. And then the bigger ones monarchs, um, painted ladies, common buckeyes, uh, and uh, smaller but beautiful ones. Um, some of these are now on our 
um, baccarus, which are blooming now. Um, and uh, uh, basically, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're using the pollen in uh, those teeny little flowers uh, to get ready for wintertime. Uh, and then the swallowtails. Uh, this is the only butterfly that I know that can use a non-native uh, plant as food. The anise swallowtail um, lays its eggs as a host and uses the nectar uh, from fennel. That is an introduced plant. Um, and the reason it can is because it used to live on the native plants that are in the same family as fennel. But now because there's so much fennel, we renamed it the anise swallowtail. The good guys, the, the pest predators that keep us clean. Um, and here, the main thing again is limit pesticide use. Uh, here's a, a small, um, uh, you know, rack up of uh, the, the, the plants, the, the insects that work with us. Um, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of insects, 30,000 insect species here in Marin County. Um, of those, only about 3% are bad bugs. The rest are either not bad or actually good, like the surfed larva or the lady beetle or ground beetles or mantids or other beetles that prey on the bad beetles and the bad thrips and the bad larva that we want to get rid of. Um, here's a female praying mantid laying eggs in a crevice in a rock wall on our property. I can attest that in the spring, we saw baby mantids coming out of that hole. So she knew exactly where, what she was doing and where she was doing it. Uh, we have a water feature that we raise a bunch of Pacific chorus frogs that eat a lot of uh, bugs in their lifetime. These are some babies that have metamorphosized from these tadpoles um, and they're sitting on top of a daylily. And then we have Western fence lizards, California knee, knee, king snakes and others. So what we're trying to say here is if that you build a habitat, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get direct benefits out of it. You're gonna be able to look at great birds and butterflies, um, and you're gonna be able to get what you need in terms of pollination and predation. So what, once you do, you do all this, well, right now, um, I, 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 I hope that I've been able to impel at least some of you to say, I'm gonna plan this right now and we're gonna plant this winter. Well, wait until you see if we're gonna get a little rain because we really need it. Um, but, but you use your property to replace what's been lost, to reconnect what's been lost and to protect what's been lost. And you'll probably get a lot of enjoyment out of it. How do I know this? Because if you build it, they will come. Questions? Well, Bob, hi. Um, that was amazing. <laughs> so much 
material you shared, there are lots of questions. So I'm going to start with the oldest and work my way through so I don't miss any. And I just want to say that this was such a rich and full, complex program. And Bob has generously um, shared that he would stay a little bit later um, to answer the questions. So here I'm just going to get going. So I'm back to bird baths, which was a little bit ago. Um, uh, listener asks, how do you keep your bird baths clean? Do you have to empty them? Do you have some quick advice? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, basically, um, uh, it, it depends on the time of the year. Um, they're used more heavily in the spring, summer, and early fall. So they're usually about once or twice a week. Uh, we go in with a stiff brush. We brush them out. And then we use a hose to clean out the dirty water and refill uh, the bird bath with clean water. Um, uh, but yes, that's the way you do need to keep them clean. And the reason why is because that if they, if they get dirty, they can spread disease from bird to bird. So that sounds like really important advice. Yeah. The next question is, is an irrigation or watering system required? That depends on uh, how big you're, you're thinking of. Um, in, the, um, in, the, in that small garden that I used as an example, we have a small uh, drip and micro spray uh, a, um, irrigation system. Um, it's it's one, one single zone. Uh, and, um, and, and that takes care of it. Um, that could easily be hand watered uh, because they're all um, drought tolerant plants in there. And so once they're established, you know, a deep watering every two weeks is probably all they need. Um, you could even use a, a, an old fashioned lawn sprinkler. Uh, you know, one of these guys that go back and forth like that uh, to do it. And, and I've used it on that uh, uh, before we put the irrigation system in. Then I got lazy and I said, I want to be out there doing it. And we put it in the irrigation system. But, but if you've got a larger system, if you've got a larger area that you're dealing with, um, then yes, you, you probably do want some sort of irrigation system. Um, and Probably the most earth friendly type to use is a, is a drip system. Um, but where you can, you can also use things like those oscillating um, uh, sprinklers, uh, like you see used on golf courses or something like that. And that depends on how big an area you really are going to cover. Uh, there's one part of my garden which is large enough, it's about a I'd say um, maybe a third of an acre where we do use some oscillating sprinklers um, that are on timers. Thank you. So it sounds like different techniques for different areas, depending right. on size and type of planting. Exactly. And so by the way, you know, you water less at some times a year. Uh, and so you need to uh, MMWD or now I guess Marin water has a weekly um, uh, watering guide of how much you need to water. And the reason is that as the, as the light that we have ebbs and flows, that's what determines how much water plants use. And so you want to water to that. Um, and irrigation systems help automate that, if you will. That's, that's really good advice, thank you. So this question is related. I don't know if it's too specific for you to answer. Um, the question is how much water is required to maintain a garden, especially in hotter areas like Nevada or Terra Linda? It, that depends on your garden. Uh, and, and, and we've got an answer for that. Um, uh, and Marin Master Gardeners has a program called Garden Walks. If you go on our website, which is on the next page um, and click on garden walks, you can set up an appointment with two master gardeners who will come out, walk through your garden with you 
and give you the information on what they think you need to do there. Wow, that is amazing personal. It's also free. Yeah, (laughs) the best price point. So wonderful advice. Okay, so that's um, www.marinmg.org. So here's a really interesting question. How do succulents figure in a native garden or don't they? Well, um, uh, here's the thing. They're great in terms of they don't use very much water after they're established. They need it while they're established. Um, uh, But they're not used by a lot of um, uh, the wildlife that we're trying to um, uh, attract. Dudlia, which is native uh, to California, um, you know, is a native. Most of the succulents you can find are not native. Um, and, and so uh, they will help hold the soil. Um, they will uh, give you fire break. Uh, if you plant them between uh, other plants in your garden. But in terms of being used by wildlife, um, with the exception of their flowers, which provide nectar and pollen, um, um, they, you know, I, I've never seen a caterpillar on a succulent. Um, and, and so um, one, one of the things we're trying to encourage is caterpillars because birds like my friend that lives with us need those. Got it, okay. So they serve some purposes, but maybe not um, the ones that this lecture right. is focused They're on. also pretty and they have their place in the garden. Um, uh, and, and, but but uh, in terms of building a habitat here, you know, they're great. And, if you build the habitat where they come from. Um, but here they're not as useful as other plants might be. Thank you. So here's a very specific question. For lack of ladybugs, what is the best natural way to combat aphids? I say aphids, I'm sorry to pronounce it. Um, encourage hoverflies. Uh, and the way you encourage hoverflies is to plant plants, hopefully native plants, that have small chrysanthemum-like single flowers because they use the pollen and nectar from those flowers, the adults do, and you you can attract them to your garden and they will lay their eggs then on plants that are uh, uh, inhabited by um, uh, aphids. Uh, and, And they will literally eat um, uh, you know, their larva will literally eat a number of aphids every day. Those same plants will also uh, attract um, uh, native parasitic wasps, teeny little wasps um, that uh, also prey on um, aphids. They lay their egg inside the aphid and their larva eats the aphid from inside the bug and then pops out as an adult. So attracting those kinds of predators is what you wanna do um, if you can't get ladybugs. Uh, But uh, buying a bag of ladybugs and putting them out um, is less successful because what happens is the ladybugs fly away. Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. You know, and so they don't stick around. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is an interesting question. I have a medium-sized deck, not a yard. Can I still build a habitat? What resources would you recommend for plants? Sure. Um, you can build a small one. Uh, your, your deck is perfect for container plants. Um, and a lot of the container plants that are used in um, uh, in the first part of that list, which I'm now going to show you, you will find plants from this list. 
right here where it says small gardens, less than a thousand square feet, um, uh, where you can plant them in large pots or other containers. Uh, for example, one of the best is the Verbena lilacina. Um, and uh, it's native, it's small, it blooms like crazy. And I have them in two, I think it's 14 or 16 inch pots. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they need to be watered more frequently than they would in the garden, but you're probably going to do that anyway. Um, so there's a number of plants on here that you can you 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 could use in um, uh, in uh, containers of some sort, uh, and that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder that I've put my email in the chat, and you can. Uh, email me and I'll send you this list as soon as Bob sends it to me. I've already gotten a handful of requests um, and I'll put my email again in. So um, on to the next question, again, about water. Has the water so shortage impacted your garden and what you plant? Yes, okay. seriously. Um, even in a plant, in a, in a garden that is probably... I'm going to say at least 50% of the plants in there have been in more than three years. Um, and yet they have suffered. Uh, and, and here, I'm not so sure it's because they're getting less water. Uh, but we have also had uh, really days of tremendous uh, abnormal heat. Um, I mean, most of uh, August, July and August here on, on our hill, uh, the temperature was above 100 degrees uh, and it's sun all day long. And so I think a lot of them just fried. Uh, now we're hoping that they will come back uh, when we get some rain. But if not, I'm going to be replacing some plants. So yes, uh, this drought has affected everything. The reason why is it's 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 unknown here. Um, it's, it's, we've never seen one like it. Uh, so hopefully the um, uh, native plants that you're going to plant when you get away from this uh, uh, lecture is uh, will help deal with that problem. So. Um... Bob, I just want to say it's 218. So do you want to take one more question? Sure, that's fine. And then I'll just remind everyone what's in the chat. So this question is, I think, an important one. Is it safe to use recycled water for natives? Sure. Oh, that was nice and short. The, 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 the problem with recycled water is it contains a, more salt than the water that we use normally that comes from the reservoirs. Um, and so the way to use it is to not use it ex uh, by itself, um, but use it um, like maybe every third watering. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and don't use it on plants that are really susceptible to damage by salt. So if you've got a part of your garden that is really salt intolerant, don't use it there. Use it in the places where, it, um, where it's okay, but not exclusively. Great, thank you again. I, I just wanna share that you're getting some beautiful thank yous. Wonderful to see your photos with the plants named, makes it feel so much more actionable and motivating than a list without the visuals. Thank you. Um, from someone else, wonderful informative presentation. There were some similar ones just about how inspiring um, this presentation was with the photos and the excellent information. Some people are gonna go shopping, I think for plants very soon. So um, Bob, I think that, you know, it was just a thrilling presentation with so much detail uh, and a great deal of specificity, which I know I always appreciate. I 
I learned a lot. Um, so I wanted to remind everyone it, just to take a minute to go through the chat. Some of you have requested that I send you um, the um, plant list in the chat. I tried to capture all your emails, but I'd really appreciate if you would email me at sash, S-A-S-H, at marincounty.org so I don't miss you. Uh, if I do miss you, please feel free to ask me again. I should get this later today and try to have them out by tomorrow. I also wanted to point out that um, in the chat, I put the book Bob mentioned, Nature's Best Hope, A New Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard by Talame. It is in the Marin County Free Library um, collection. So you can click on that link or go to marinlibrary.org and look for it after the talk. I also put the um, link for the California Native Plant Society, Calscape. Uh, Calscape dot org it's in the chat so that's c-a-l-s-c-a-p-e dot o-r-g i tried it during the lecture you just put in your address and get a great plant list so that is a pretty handy tidbit i really appreciate that um so and, and Fred, oh go ahead well don't forget if you've got questions that i couldn't answer um if you uh, i i also work on the help desk but there's a lot of folks work on the help desk and that's, if you email helpdesk at marinmg.org, you'll get an answer. Okay, so that's excellent information. And I'll put that in the chat too. And then I think with that, um, we will say goodbye. And thank you once again, it was really an, a, such a fabulous presentation. And Thanks. usually within two weeks, you should be able to find it on the YouTube channel, sometimes faster, but um, there's only one really hardworking media tech we have. So um, it, it sometimes can take two weeks. So look at uh, YouTube um, for Marin County Free Library presentations and you'll find this. So with that, I will say enjoy your afternoon and thank you again, Bob. And um, we'll say goodbye for today. My pleasure. Enjoy your afternoon, everyone. Thanks.